morning, everybody. This is Dr. Kabir Sardana from Delhi, and my topic of my talk is investigation in acne. So, at the outset, I like to thank the organizers for this topic because it's a very practical and useful topic for most clinicians, and it's nice to speak on this topic for a change. So, I'm going to cover this topic under four headings. So, we're going to discuss investigations and the rationale for drug therapy to rule out a few common mimickers. And of course, the one that most of you would like to listen to would be hormonal acne. And of course, lastly, the topic of my interest that is resistance. So let's begin with the first scenario, drugs. So uh, this is a patient who comes to you with uh, mild to moderate acne and you can see perspiration around the nose and also the face. And most of the conventional uh, dermatologists, so-called old timers would like to give antibiotics. So let's discuss antibiotics. Now the antibiotic classes in acne are of three broad categories. The first are cyclines, which are uh, doxycycline and minocycline, which are also three types, modified release, immediate release and extended release. Then you have macrolides and keratolides. And then of course, the other antibiotics that we don't use too often, cephalosporins, septron and levofloxacin. So let's begin with uh, uh, you know, the idle antibiotics to be used in our country. Uh, now this is a study that we published a few years back uh, and it's been cited in many journals where we analyze the resistance pattern of antibiotics in our country in about 85 patients we, that we tested. And we found that, you know, erythromycin and clindamycin have got high resistance. Hence, monotherapy with these two antibiotics would fail. Tetradoxy is much lower. Minocycline is the lowest. And of course, leofloxin is the next. And of course, erythromycin, which is, I know, a pet favorite of most of us, has got one of the highest resistance in the world, actually. 100% resistance is nowhere in the world except in Mexico. So this gives you a glimpse on what you could ideally do. Of course, I know that most of us will not normally follow uh, research, but that's just a glimpse. Now come to macrolides. Now this is something which I want to state at the outset that though estromycin, uh, some of us might feel is very effective in acne, but remember that the idea of giving an antibiotic in acne is not just because it kills the organism on culture. I can give you 10 more antibiotics that you can never imagine work in acne, but it's never written in acne because Giving a drug used for other disorders in acne where it be misused can cause resistance to other organisms. And hence, that's the very important reason for not giving drugs like azithromycin. And this is from Rook's 8th edition, and it's a copy-paste. Note what they say. They say that as azithromycin is commonly used to treat a variety of systemic infections, its use should be restricted and discouraged. So there's evidence, a lot of data on why you should not be using azithromycin, but in our country, the converse is true for whatever reason. So let's look at what, what is important and the class that you should write a lot in acne if you want to write is doxycycline and minocycline. Now I'm going to look at a different topic here today. Uh, what are these sub antimicrobial cyclines? So these are drugs that do not achieve the MIC. That is, they don't hit the MIC of the acne. They don't cross that level. So if they don't cross that level, they'll not, not be any resistance. Plus they are got a very potent anti-inflammatory action. And so the two classes that are important here are doxycycline MR and doxycycline ER and aminocycline ER. Now the MR basically means modified release. So this particular tablet has got two components, 10 mg and 30 mg. That 10 mg has a sudden peak, 30 mg has got a slow peak. And of course the ER that you all have been writing in India for past one year, in which there are actually 10 different strengths. The concept is very simple. The MR antibiotic was used and is approved for you know, oral infections by dentists. It does not cross the MIC barrier. Theoretically, it would not cause resistance. The ER, on the contrary, that can cross the MIC level, but it is according to body weight. Apart from the body weight story, the ER has got no great advantage over conventional uh, cycling. So, in essence, if you would like to give something to prevent resistance and to have an efficacy in acne, probably the MR would be very good. Uh, what you're giving now, I don't, uh, nowadays is called the immediate release. This is also not bad, but the ER is, well, uh, Pretty fancy take because minus the so-called vestibular side effect, nothing really is there in it. So, uh, what to use? Just in a summary, if you look at efficacy data, doxycycline is as good as minocycline, which is as good as lamicycline. So, you can choose any of these three uh, if it's your preference, but choose a good quality brand. I usually give minocycline. The one with least side effects, doxycycline. The one with least cost, doxycycline. And the one with these resistance in our countries, minocycline. So I leave that to clinicians as to what they write. Now let's look at the common drugs versus macrolides. In azithromycin, remember the major contraindications are jaundice. 
especially if there's a history of jaundice, hepatic dysfunction with a prior use of estromycin. Look at cardiac conduction defects. It's very common nowadays. People give uh, uh, this molecule with uh, FCQS in COVID-19. So look for that, uh, especially it was at easy point is it can happen to most people. GI side effects are important, but they are usually reversible. And of course, some people have had a chronic uh, dysentery due to uh, prostitutium difficile. And it can be seen even after giving therapy after two months. And very important because in India, we have misuse of this antibiotic for acne. And there's a very rare side effect that people with mycena gravis can have an aggravation of weakness. Now, how should you investigate? Nothing much is then literature. You can do an NFT, a KFT, and I would suggest an ECG, especially because some of your patients might be taking SCQs on their own. With uh, And remember that with this drug, you must avoid lovastatin, warfarin, cyclosporine, uh, diazopyramide uh, and theophylline. This is specific for estromycin. Let's come to uh, tetracyclines. Uh, Minocycline specifically causes dress, can cause SSR like reaction, drug induced LE and even vasculitis, and rarely autoimmune hepatitis. Other side effects that have been seen include uh, pigmentation of the tissue, but uh, I've not seen much of it in our skin type, and of course, uncommonly increased intracellular intracranial pressure. Now, for what you should investigate, well, if you look at the guidelines, you will not find much, but LFT KFT is a safe bet. I would suggest ANA because there are cases, documented literature of drug induced LE due to minocycline, which have got ANA positivity and DSDNA positivity. It is good to do it. Why? You see, if you do an ANA before starting therapy and if it's positive, you're on the safe side. Tomorrow, patient has an ANA testing done, it's positive. He might, you know, it could be a medical legal issue for you because there are reports of ANA induced by minocycline with or without skin and systemic symptoms. So that's the two antibodies I'm going to discuss. I will not discuss the rest for investigation. Then the second, of course, case is this, a patient who's got nodulocystic acne with you know, abscesses all over the face. And I'm sure most of you would like to give isretinoin. So let's look at isretinoin. Now in isretinoin, uh, I'm going to look at the salient uh, you know, uh, drug side effects. Remember that uh, nowadays the latest recommendation is that you should do a baseline test and you have a normal baseline value in healthy individuals, do not repeat a test for the first month, do it in two months and they can stop. Now, repeat laboratory studies now appear to be optional, they're not mandatory like we had before. I'm going to cover the few important ones and how to address them. Lipid, well, there will be a progressive increase in the first six weeks. It will normalize to baseline in two to four weeks after stopping therapy. So, it's going to happen to most of my patients. Uh, you can give uh, drugs to prevent it like EFAs, but the best thing is tell the patient that there would be a rise. LFTs, there would be a rise in the first two to eight weeks of therapy. Again, they would stop and become normal after four weeks of stopping therapy. In LFT, the most important thing now is that look for a GGT level, not ALTST. The ALTST or the SGOT, SGPT is released by multiple organs, by muscle, by you know bone also. But the GGT is specific for liver damage and has been now shown in studies that isretinoin probably is you know, using this as a, as a marker is better. So use the GGT if possible. And if the values of any of these tests like GGT or LFT, KFT go up three times the normal, stop it. And the third test that has been added recently is baseline CK levels. Now, it's important why? Because there are reports of rhabdomyolysis that can cause kidney failure and shutdown, especially in patients who've got a history of activity, like people who stress out, who walk, who gym, who play games. Do a baseline level, uh, it, will, it has got huge medical, legal and actually medically important significance. The investigations for astretinoin now are very simple. So the three things that we've done are UFT, an LFT and a lipid of course and a CK. And the UPT is the pregnancy test, do it every time during therapy and even after therapy. LFT and uh, lipid profile and CK levels, now it is baseline in two months and then stop it. Now, so the point is that at two months, if you notice this particular parameter assessment, you can actually stop all your testing, except, except if you do not, if you change your dose. So if you do not change your dose and your baseline values are normal, and the patient is healthy, do not repeat tests after two months. That is the take home of the latest guidelines on astretinoin. Don't repeat tests till the end of life is not required, except UPT. That even after stopping therapy, ask the patient to do a UPT after treatment. Right, now come to uh, the mimickers. Now, this is a very common thing that you see in practice that somebody comes to you with acne and suddenly he's got a cluster flare or else he 
He's on therapy and he's got a bus stop left. So when you have such a scenario in a patient of yours, what are the possibilities? So these are the possibilities. The first is pseudo acne fulminans. Uh, second is staph aureus colonization, very common with astretinoin therapy, mind you. Of course, gram negative folliculitis and uncommonly tinea fascia. So what are you gonna do? Very, very simple. Do a simple smear. So that's what, what I would recommend. Just do a simple gram stain. Uh, stain with gymsa, you get no diagnosis. Most of them are either staph aureus or gram negatives. If you, of course, have a laboratory, do a culture of sensitivity. It is of great use in some cases. So uh, this is the case, a very classical case uh, came to us. He was an astretinoin and azithromycin for six months. And when the patient didn't respond, then he went to another clinician who gave him azithromycin for six months. Of course, topical, salicylic acid, P, etc. Now, the take home point here is two points. Number one, remember this combination of giving an antibiotic with astretinoin without any other rationale is got no logic. I mean, astretinoin by itself is such a powerful drug. You don't require any co concomitant antibiotic. And of course, giving astromycin per se is something you should really avoid because this drug is used for many things in medical sciences, even COVID 19. Nevertheless, so this patient came to us, and you know, the first thing we thought of was resistance. But we decided to make a smear and we found it was just gram negative folliculitis, nothing else. So it's a very common problem now, especially with the huge abuse of estromycin in our country. And so, so it's very useful to do a smear in such cases. And you know, you just stain the antibiotic. This patient was changed to Leofloxin and he responded in 10 days. Of course, he's having a recurrent uh, gram negative folliculitis attacks and he responds to the same antibiotic. Uh, then come to the, the third scenario that is persistent female acne. Now, as I as I probably said in some of the talks before, this is a classical morphology of a female acne patient, wherein the acne occurs along the jawline. There is mild hirsutism, and there is failure of recurrent antibiotics. So that's a classical presentation of these patients. Usually, they have got acne which is there in females beyond 25 years of age. So it is a persistent or a adult onset acne. So in such cases, what would you do? Of course, these are patients who have failed antibiotics. They probably have been given astretinoin and had recurrences. So when you go around testing for uh, in such patients, you should look at two things. What are the aims of testing and where to do it? So the aims are very simple, to find out the possible causes of hyperandrogenism. And of course, rule out other mimickers, that is other causes of uh, increased androgen level, apart from what we would like to look for. When to do it, do it in the first five days of the cycle. Do not give an OCP for the last three months. That's very important. Otherwise, this test is of no use. And take an ATM sample except for AMH. That is the anti mullerian hormone wherein it doesn't require any ATM AM sampling at all. In fact, it doesn't require any timing at all. It can be done any time in the cycle. So what should be ordered? Now, there are the concept of testing for androgens is you look at the source. So the source of androgens can be the ovaries adrenal glands can be just a tissue level testosterone increase or of course other mimickers. So for the ovaries, normally this is what is done, the FSH LH ratio, androcenidion, a USG or an anti mullerian hormone test. Adrenal glands, you should do a 17 OHP or a DHES. And of course, dosage testosterone and free testosterone is used for a general generic marker. C-alpha diol is done sometimes and the rest of course is Thyroid disorders, you do THH, platin, you do platinum levels. And yes, most of us do insulin levels. Now, this is the protocol given in most books, endocrinological books. Now, let us analyze them one by one. This particular ratio actually is redundant. Uh, no great guideline. In fact, the NIH guideline doesn't even mention it. Because in obese PCOS patients, there will be no LS surge. So they'll have PCOS without having a reversal ratio. This test is actually went for only ovary tumors. It's a very expensive test. A lot of money is wasted in it. Don't do it otherwise. Testosterone free, never, never do it. Uh, I can assure this to you that no national laboratory has got the kind of sensitive test for diagnosing a patient of androgenic disorder with this particular test. It's a complete waste of money. You need advanced tests and ex extremely sensitive kits to diagnose a disorder with this test. Don't do it. Don't waste your money. Alpha diol again is very expensive. It's a great test, but very expensive, not required. 17 OHP is not to be done in every case. It should be, it should be done in cases where you feel there is an underlying uh, 17 OHP hyperactivity as NCCH. So if you look at this test now, look at the test list now, you can remove some of them. So you have in the ovaries, USG or an AMH, 
may be antisynergion. For adrenal glands, in some cases, yes, adrenal OHP and DHEs, and then of course, total testosterone and free antigen index and free alpha diol. Now, I'll, I'll try to focus on uh, what is relevant. Before that, let's look at AMH. Now, uh, why are we talking about AMH? You see, the point is that the diagnosis of PCOS is made conventionally by ultrasonography. The USG, ideally to be done, is transvaginal. But what we do in practice is transabdominal, and that's because most of our patients might be unmarried and they would not want a transvaginal ultrasound. Hence, what really happens is that you are getting a report from an ultrasonographic machine based on the probe that is not there in guidelines. So basically, we are getting a report of PCOS from a USA specialist who is using a transabdominal probe that has got its own problems. It doesn't diagnose PCOS in obese patients. It's not sensitive enough, and most important of all, it's not there in any guideline. So the USG has a problem. The second problem is that the USG is not able to diagnose uh, abnormality in the pre follicles. And hence, it is said that the AMH is more sensitive and a deeper probe than the USG. So there are the two reasons why the AMH is sensitive for diagnosing uh, PCOS. Uh, and hence, if you look at articles, of course, we published a study uh, way back, and then there are articles all over the world, there's a whole issue of uh, clinical endocrinology on AMH. And there are more than 311 articles in the last 10 years, including 40 just this year, on AMH. So AMH is a very valid tool for using for diagnosing of PCOS, the blood test. Uh, it is slightly costly, but it saves a lot of time and effort. So uh, what protocol uh, can you follow for your, for your patients? This is a simple protocol I'm going to tell you. Order a total testosterone, order a free antigen index and prolactin. If the total testosterone is raised, Especially if it is more than 144, do a DHGS level, do an MRI for a scan, and the most probable cause could be a tumor. On the contrary, if the A4 is increased, that is the antisynergion level, do a TVUSG and diagnose an ovarian tumor. If the value is less than 144, above 100, the most common cause is PCOS, where you have increased AMH level and increased fire. If on the contrary the image is normal, then you can think of doing a 7 day OHP and diagnose NCCH depending on the values that have been stated here. If the value is less than 100 and more than 60, the most common cause is PCOS again. If it is normal and you have the money to spend, do a 3 alpha diol, but rule out PCOS first. Latin is increased, the most common cause is hypothyroidism. If that is excluded and it is normal thyroid, then look at the level if the Prolactin level is mildly increased, it could be physiological or even PCOS. If it is highly increased, more than 100, most common is the mass or an adenoma, due to adenoma. And of course, if it's moderately increased, it's due to drugs. This is a simple algorithm uh, for diagnosing most conditions that you see in literature. Now, come to uh, can you do lesser tests? Of course, you can. We have published a study recently where we compared the hormonal profile in uh, late onset acne and persistent acne, and we found that you can manage. Uh, Diagnosis without even doing the whole array of tests by just doing a few tests like the FIRE. So what is the FIRE? The FIRE actually is uh, the free antigen index, the ratio of testosterone total and SSPG. So you do that in your patients, do an AMH, it diagnoses a lot of cases of PCOS very accurately. Examine the patients, look for signs of, evidence signs of uh, hyperandrogenism and of course ask a history of irregular cycle. So we, so now actually in most cases this is what I do and it suffices in many cases we've done Already three studies published in literature, we have an idea as to how to save patients money also and of course diagnose them. I'll give you a few examples of this particular uh, aspect. As a patient with evident hormonal acne, uh, a patient who is beyond 25 years of age, actually on the jawline, and this is her blood report. Now you see the blood report carefully. Image is markedly raised. It's the cutoff value is about 5, so it's 15. SSBG is 25.8 and the testosterone is 66.2. Now to diagnose, uh, to do the FAI, you need to divide the testosterone SSBG. But note the values. The value of uh, testosterone is in nanogram per deciliter. The value of SSBG is in nanomoles per liter. So to convert this, you need to multiply testosterone value by 0 0.4. Then you get the same units as SSBG. Multiply by 100 and divide by 25.8. Anything beyond 5 of FIA is it signifies abnormality. So this is how you calculate a fire. So this is an evident case of increased fire with a evident PCOS. Another case who came with a little bit of hirsutism and acne on the jawline. Again, she's adult acne, female patient. This was her report. Look at the testosterone level. It is high. 
60 and beyond is supposed to be high, so it's like in that 60 to 100 range. The allergen index is 6.23, again it's high. And of course, we put it on OCPs. Uh, the US FDA approved molecule is ethanol estradiol and prosperinone, 24 pill with a four day gap for four months. And now see the blood report. You'll see that the testosterone has not markedly changed, but the estrogen has caused increased amount of SHBG that tends to trap the testosterone and the TA has come down to 3.52. So, uh, giving OCPs can actually change your hormonal acne values and get you a good report and of course, a pretty good improvement. Of course, you see the histogram is still there, but the acne is much better. Of course, there are advanced tests. Uh, if you have the money, you can diagnose pro, pro acne by doing tests of diocesan levels and of course, you can do resistance testing. So, the last thing I want to discuss in brief is resistance testing. Uh, this is how we do it. Uh, a patient comes to you, you isolate the patient sample from the follicle transport in BHI medium in an anaerobic jar, then do a PCR, a sequencing and blast it. And then of course you do a culture and do a, a sensitivity of the particular uh, organism. This is how we do a p uh, uh, 16 s RNA-PCR where we elute out the relevant uh, SX and then of course do a PCR. So this is what we have been doing for the last seven years and uh, isolating patients culture, extracting their genome and then of course going ahead and doing a sequencing and blasting it. This is our blast data. We have the largest data of p from the country and so on and as NCBI. So, uh, and of course this is the basis of our resistance studies. And so I like to basically close this particular presentation by, by, by telling the audience that the fact that we recommend not using estromycin is based on a lot of hardcore data, scientific data. And I would at the end of the day request our clinician friends to avoid using estromycin because we are actually destroying a drug class. With that, I will end this talk and thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you.